Hello. Welcome to St. Matthew's Anglican Church in a very smoky Portland, Oregon. Because of the poor air quality here on the West Coast, we're not having an in-person service this week. We're encouraging everyone to stay home, stay in the safety of their house, apartment, home, and we'll worship together in this way, online. We're so glad you've been able to find us. Our first hymn is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we, we have, have erred, erred and strayed from your ways, ways like lost, lost sheep. sheep. We, we have, have followed, followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have, we have offended, offended against your holy laws. laws. We, we have, have left undone those things which, which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. done. And apart, and apart from, from your, your grace, grace there, there is, is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent 
according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our our mouth mouth shall proclaim proclaim your your praise. praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. And now we'll say together our first canticle. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you have become exceedingly glorious. You are clothed with majesty and honor. You appointed the moon to mark the seasons, and the sun knows it's going down. Man goes forth to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. These all wait upon you that you may give them food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it, and when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are troubled. When you take away their breath, they die, and are turned again to their dust. When you let your breath go forth, they shall be made, and you shall renew the face of the earth. The glorious majesty of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in all his works. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being, and so shall my words please him. My joy shall be in the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. And now for the younger members of our congregation, today's true story from the Bible. Today's story is called God Protects Moses. Because of the famine, Israel and his family settled down to live in Egypt. Over time, they had more and more children and grew to be a great people. Joseph died, and after a while, a new pharaoh came into power who did not remember Joseph or what he had done to save Egypt. This new king thought there were too many Israelites. He thought they would rise up and attack Egypt. So pharaoh turned the Israelites into slaves. He put slave drivers over them and made them carry heavy loads, work in the fields, make bricks, and build cities. But God blessed his people in the midst of all this trouble, and their families continued to grow. When Pharaoh saw this, he was unhappy. He told the midwives, who helped mothers when they were having their babies to kill all the baby boys. But the midwives feared God more than Pharaoh, and they did not obey. God blessed the midwives, and the Israelites had even more children. Not long after that, Pharaoh commanded that every Israelite baby boy should be thrown into the Nile River. Only daughters were spared. 
there was one Hebrew woman who had a fine baby boy. She was afraid he would be killed, so she hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she made a basket out of reeds and coated it with black tar to keep the water out and to help it float. She put her baby son in the basket and hid it among the reeds in the river bank. She assigned her daughter to watch him. That morning, Pharaoh's daughter came to the river and found the baby in the basket. The baby's sister came out from where she was hiding and offered to find a woman to nurse the infant. Pharaoh's daughter agreed and sent the baby back to his mother to care for him until he was older. Later, when the boy came to live with her, she named him Moses and raised him in Pharaoh's courts. God saved Moses because he was part of God's plan to help his suffering people. Did you know that the word God used for Moses' basket is the same word that is used for Noah's great boat, the ark? Just like God used the ark to save Noah, God used the little basket to save Moses. God protected baby Moses from Pharaoh's order because God planned to use him to rescue his people from their slavery in Egypt. Many years later, God protected baby Jesus from another evil king. King Herod tried to kill him, but God warned Joseph in a dream to go to a place of safety, Egypt. Jesus, like Moses, grew up to rescue God's people from slavery, but it was a different kind of slavery. Jesus would rescue his people from a slavery to sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your provision, for your protection, for your rescue. Thank you, Father, for the care with which you guarded Moses. And despite the most powerful man in the country's word, Pharaoh, his order was not carried out against Moses. You saved him, even allowing his mother then to lawfully take care of him and raise him until he grew up in Pharaoh's court. We thank you that in the same way you protected your son so that he could live and not die until the appointed time. Thank you, Father, that you look after us and you will guard us until that time that you call us home to be with you forever. We thank you, Father, for your care and your protection. In Jesus' name. And now let's say together these verses from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sin and heals all your infirmities, who saves your life from the pit, and crowns you with mercy and loving kindness, who satisfies you with good things, renewing your youth like an eagle's. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all those who are oppressed with wrong. He showed his ways to Moses, his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, long-suffering and of great goodness, he will not always chide us, 
neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy also toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he set our sins from us. As a father pities his own children, so is the Lord merciful to those who fear him. For he knows whereof we are made, he remembers that we are but dust. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. reading from Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, 
and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house, whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now together, let's say the second canticle. Oh, be, be joyful, joyful in the Lord, Lord all you all lands. lands. Serve, Serve the Lord, Lord with, gladness, with gladness, and come before his, his presence with a song. Be assured that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. O oh, go your way into his courts with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures from generation to generation. A reading from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 6 through 11. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, in unison, we say the third canticle. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia! Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. Our 
A reading from John chapter 11, beginning to read at verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that dramatic scene during Jesus' ministry. Thank you, Father, that you did indeed send him. And that he, after he died, was raised to new and glorious life. We thank you that that promise holds for us too, for all who are in him, in Christ, and all who trust in him and believe in his name. Thank you, Father, that you have the power to bring life out of death. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our year-long journey through the Bible, we arrive today at Ezekiel chapter 37. And the chapter begins like this. Ezekiel says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. So initially, we see that God is guiding the prophet. He's with the prophet. There's an almost gentleness in his approach. The Lord's hand is upon Ezekiel. And it's as if God says, come with me. I want to show you something. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. And so here is Ezekiel being guided by the Lord. The hand of the Lord is upon him. And now he is being brought out, somehow transported to a valley in the spirit of the Lord. God's Holy Spirit is at work taking him to this place to show him this vision. And he was set down in the middle of the valley. Now we think of valleys as rather nice places. How green was my valley? Places that are fertile 
places that are beautiful and safe and tranquil. But valleys tended to be looked at differently by the people of Israel. They were wary of valleys. For valleys were exceedingly dry, very hot, and somewhat dangerous. They preferred to be on the heights, to go up, such as a journey to Jerusalem would take them up in elevation. And so to go to a valley, it might be necessary, but it was rarely desired. One thinks of the 23rd Psalm, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. When you're in a valley, it's very hot, it's very dry, and you are very vulnerable because enemies have the advantage of height. They can look down upon you and rain weapons, stones, arrows down upon you. Valleys, hmm, not such a nice place, but here Ezekiel is taken to one and it was full of bones, a gruesome sight. And the Lord led me around among them. Again, God seems to be taking his time. He's in no hurry. He says, let's just walk among these bones for a while. I want you to take a good look at them to see how many there are and to note their condition. As far as quantity, there were many. As far as quality, they were very dry. Dry, brittle, parched human bones. Skeletal remains, though they didn't look like skeletons any longer. They were just assortments of bones. No longer even holding the shape of the person they once were. There he was, Ezekiel, set down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And the Lord led him around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. Well, the Lord allows Ezekiel to absorb the situation he's in, to take it in what he is seeing, this terrible sight, as though there was a great battle fought in this valley, but not recently, long, long ago. And the defeated soldiers fell where they were struck, and now much time has passed and the aridness of the valley, the lack of moisture, the hot sun, and the fact that, again, people tend to avoid valleys meant that the bodies just lay where they fell. And after a great period of time, nothing is left but an assortment of bones. And then God speaks to the prophet again. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Well, what an extraordinary question. The obvious answer would be, don't be silly. But it was God who spoke the word, so Ezekiel wouldn't say that. With all due respect, he simply answers, O oh Lord God, you know. Surely no human being would look upon this scene and think there was any possibility of life returning to these people. <laughs> of course not. There had been a few miraculous occasions in the Old Testament up to this point when someone had been raised from the dead. And it was always a miracle, it was always rare, it was always extraordinary, but someone who had actually physically died on a few occasions was resuscitated and brought back to life. That was unusual, 
But when it did happen, it happened to someone who had only recently died. And so his body, we might say, was still warm. It had not begun to decompose. And so when a prophet would lay his hands upon the person or lie down over him, the person, by God's grace, might be raised back to life again. But starting with much better material than is found here on the valley floor. This is nothing but a great valley filled with very dry bones. And so when God asks, son of man, and that's how he addresses Ezekiel, can these bones live? He's asking if a miracle can occur, a miracle greater than Ezekiel or anyone else for that matter has ever seen. No one has tried to resurrect or even resuscitate a valley of very dry bones before. But Ezekiel knows he's dealing with God. So what can he say but, oh Lord God, you know. I don't know. I couldn't possibly know. It is beyond the realm of nature. It is impossible. But with you, all things are possible. So he simply says, you know. And sure enough, God does know. Well, God doesn't answer his own question. He simply says to Ezekiel, prophesy over these bones. Well, God has asked Ezekiel to do unusual things already. As we saw last week, he showed him a scroll and said, eat it, chew it, swallow it, consume it, eat it. And then Ezekiel was obedient to the word of the Lord. And now he's receiving this command, prophesy over these bones. And God gives him the script, tells him what his sermon shall be. He says, say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, these dry bones, they didn't even have, as it's often put in the scriptures, ears to hear. How in the world were they going to hear the word of the Lord? But Ezekiel must go on and say, thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. God is promising to do the impossible. Here we come upon a word, breath, which we're going to see many times in this passage, because the same Hebrew word also means spirit or wind. Only the context determines what English word should be used in translation. But here is the message that Ezekiel is to preach. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Well, what is Ezekiel to do? If he is to be obedient to the Lord God, he is to do exactly as he is told. And so he does. He stands and preaches to a valley of very dry bones. More than one public speaker has recounted a painful experience of speaking to a dead audience, as they might put it. But no one has ever spoken or preached to a more unlikely congregation than Ezekiel. Prophesy over these dead bones. The scene is almost comic. Imagine Ezekiel standing up, <clears throat> clearing his throat and beginning his prophecy. 
and he alone is speaking. He's the only one who can speak other than the Lord God. And uh, he can speak without fear of interruption or contradiction, for he is speaking to a valley of dry bones. And so Ezekiel says, so, in meaning so, because God ordered me to do so, I did. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. Here is a scene that, if it were a major motion picture, would cause the hairs on the back of your neck to stand up. You could hear a pin drop in the theater. Everyone would be gripped. The man, Ezekiel, is alone in a valley of dry bones. He should be the only sound in the entire valley. And yet after, and it's only after he steps out in obedience, faithfully fulfilling what God commanded despite the circumstances, the unlikeliness of success. It's only after he faithfully begins to prophesy that there was a sound. And behold, what is the sound that reaches Ezekiel's ears? A rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. The bones found each other. They didn't come together in some kind of makeshift way, but they came together bone to its bone. Every bone remembered which bone it was to be attached to. And as I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh came upon them, and skin had covered them. Ezekiel is seeing a movie played backwards. It's as though he is watching in reverse the decomposition of a multitude of people. If there had been some kind of stop action photography after the great battle and you could see in fast motion the terrible sight of a large army decomposing on the valley floor. Now Ezekiel is seeing that movie in reverse. Now he sees not a great many bones, but now he sees a valley full of, well, corpses. They're not alive. They're not moving. They're not breathing or speaking. But nevertheless, it's, though they are dead men, corpses, it's still a miracle because only moments before they had been nothing but dried bones. Wow. So already Ezekiel is seeing a remarkable miracle take place before his very eyes. But there was no breath in them. Then the Lord God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, or the four winds, or the spirit, say to the breath, come, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So, once again, in obedience to God's command, Ezekiel prophesied as he commanded me, he says, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. What a dramatic sight. And it's this two-part fulfillment that might give it even more drama. And in the way that God has brought these bones back to life, this great army has been restored to its previous glory. In a very big and dramatic way, it echoes 
a rather small and moving event that we read about way back in the second chapter of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. When we read of the creation of mankind, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Well, in the same way, but on a much larger scale, so breath has entered these corpses at the behest of the prophet Ezekiel. God commanded him to preach, and it's only after he obediently begins to prophesy that breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, and Ezekiel sees before him an exceedingly great army. One can hardly imagine the shock that must have registered on his face, how he would just stare and, and blink and, and wonder at what has happened. Remember the ridiculous question that God had asked him only minutes before. Son of man, can these bones live? Well, anyone would say, of course not. Of course not. But Ezekiel wisely answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And God did know. And now Ezekiel knows. And now we know. We know what God can do. We know how he can bring the dead to life. We know now how he can do the impossible. Then the Lord God said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. That was the thinking of the people of Israel after the city of Jerusalem had been sacked, the temple had been destroyed, and most of the people of the city, the inhabitants, had been marched to Babylon. That's where they are now. That's where Ezekiel is. And they feel as though all hope is lost. They've lost the will to survive. They are in a hopeless situation. And so they say to themselves and to one another, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are indeed cut off because we are in exile. We are not in our place. We are not in a position to worship our God. We are hardly a people. What are we? We are in exile and the end is nigh. Well, God has another message for Ezekiel. Therefore, he says, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. Do you remember last week, God seemed reluctant to call his people my people. He even called them the nations as though they were Gentiles. But now they are my people, God says. And now he is promising to do something dramatic. Just as it seemed impossible for, for bones to become an exceedingly great army, so the people in exile with Ezekiel are thinking, at this point, it's impossible. How can we ever be rescued? How can we ever be restored? Because of our sin, we have reached the end. Our hope is lost. But God, through Ezekiel, is telling them that he's going to do a great work. He is going to do the impossible. He is going to take them from death in Babylon to life in Israel. He is going to restore them to Jerusalem. And he announces this through his prophet Ezekiel and in 
this great vision that took place in a valley. And when God does this, he says, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. And so when in 539 B.C. this ruler Cyrus is led to release the people of Israel out of Babylon to return to their home and to rebuild their city and their temple. Something that, humanly speaking, was miraculous. No one saw that coming. But God did. And Ezekiel did when it was revealed to him. And now the people know it's coming. God will do this. He is giving them a vision of great hope of what he can do, that he can do the impossible. And he wants them then to know that when they're back in Jerusalem, when they are rebuilding the temple, when they are gathered together once again as a nation of Israel, as God's people in God's land, worshiping at God's place, he wants them to remember what Ezekiel said to them while they were in captivity. And when they do, they shall know that he is the Lord, for no one else could have done what he did. And so it is with us. What's only a hint in the Old Testament, that is resurrection from the dead, bursts into glorious technicolor in the New Testament, where we actually see it in Jesus Christ, he physically dies, rests dead as a corpse for three days before God raises him not just back to life as previous resuscitations went, but has him pass through death to rise to a new and eternal life with a new spiritual body. And in Christ, we see that what God has done once for his son, he will do in multitude for all those who are in Christ, either when we die or upon the last day. But lying before us in our future is a great resurrection. And here we begin to see it illustrated. We heard in the gospel reading Jesus talking about his own resurrection. Indeed, he said to one of his followers, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then Jesus had a question for Martha. Having said this, he asks her, and I dare say he asks each one of us this question, do you believe this? For your future destiny depends upon the answer that you give to that question. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And do you believe that Whoever believes in him, even though he dies, yet shall he live eternally? It's the question that Jesus asks, and his life, his death, and his resurrection answer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the vision you gave Ezekiel, and we thank you, Father, for the resurrection that you gave to your son. Thank you that we, too, can live with the hope that you will do the impossible, that when we die, we shall be raised again. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name.
Let's stand and say together what we believe as it's been stated in the Apostles' Creed. I, I believe, believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And earth. I, I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, Son our Lord. Lord. He, he was, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Mary. He, he suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I will 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, Christ have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us, and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Heavenly Father, in our helplessness, we cry out to you, the creator and sustainer of the universe. We thank you that you are in control, regardless of our circumstances, and that we can cling to you in this time of chaos and tragedy. We commit into your hands everyone who has lost a home or a loved one in the wildfires sweeping the West Coast. 
We pray for your blessing and protection on those who are evacuating and for those who are fighting the fires. We pray for comfort for the families of the 62,000 people in nursing homes who have died from COVID-19. And we pray that you would provide for the refugees in Greece affected after a fast-moving fire destroyed most of Europe's biggest refugee camp. And we pray, pray for the leaders of the countries around them that they would provide for their needs. We thank you for the power of the gospel and we pray that we would have confidence to share the good news of Jesus with others and point them to you as the source of our hope. We pray for all those involved in mission work, for Jason and Angie, Bob and Sammy, Jason and Danica, Al and Cheryl, Michael and Pam, Cliff and Bobby, Jeremy and Jamie, Mary, Bill and Marty, Johan and Louise, and Kristen, and for all in our congregation who share the good news of Jesus with others. We pray for our sister churches, St. John the Baptist in Donwe, Myanmar, and Communion Anglican Church in Paraiba, Brazil. Strengthen and guide them. We ask for your blessing on our military loved ones, for Emma, Chris, Kalani, Simon, Sarah, Joel, Matthew, and Andrew. Father, we pray that your hand of protection would be on our expectant mothers, Bethany, Jamie, Carrie, and Callie. And we pray for those who are experiencing infertility or for those who have lost a child. We pray for those with urgent needs, for Al, Elizabeth, Darlene, Bonnie, Mary, Michael, Ray, Thomas, Donna, Georgine, Joe, Judy and Nancy. And we pray for your presence to be very real with Carrie, who's on hospice. And Father, we pray for the comfort that only you can provide for those who are bereaved, for the Bowen family, the Cullen family and the Dodd family. Oh God, because without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty Father, who gave your only Son to die for our sins and to rise for our justification. Give us grace so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in purity of life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, grant that we may grow in faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you, give you humble, humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. 
And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.